Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, and former World Cup winner, top 14 winner, Champions Cup winner, won it all, Jerome Kano. We will bring in our special guest shortly as well to have a look ahead to the Wallabies and their meeting with France this weekend. But how are you guys, first of all? Because Jerome, you were down in Johnny's neck of the woods at the weekend, weren't you? I was in Bayonne. It was, How'd it uh, go? Uh, I was in, oh, we lost. We lost the game. I uh, had a lot of my young guns from the Esquires playing in the game, which was quite special. But, um, man, what a place to play it. The atmosphere, the, the singing, the crowd. Oh, good. It's, uh, it's definitely a unique place to go and play. And, um, yeah, despite the result, uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience, great, great uh, occasion. Mate, you'd have played in pretty much every awesome stadium in the world. Where, for me, Stade Jean Dauger is right up there in terms of atmosphere, public behind you, engagement with the crowd, like it's rocking. Like, where would you rank it in terms of the places you've been to and played and coached at? I was speaking to one of my coaches uh, before that game, and, and we were t- I was talking specifically about uh, the Bayonne Stadium. It definitely sits uh, up there with... Uh, it's, it's not as loud as Test Match... Uh, Test match uh, arenas, but just the constant singing and the the party atmosphere that it has for such a tiny, tiny city, tiny uh, small club, it's incredible, and it just goes for the for the uh, whole duration of the game. Like you hear in the warm up, the the song "Fit Fit the Molly On," and everyone's singing it before the game. The the whole stadium goes dark, and everyone's got their lights uh, flashing. It's uh, yeah. It's, Definitely sits up there with some one of the most unique, special places that I've played at or been a part of. And coming on to your weekend, Johnny, a bit of a contrast to Murrayfield, which wasn't so rocking. Uh, so weirdly, compl- we were talking about this in the stands, so during commentary and like Murrayfield, if you go and play against Edinburgh, it had a horrible nickname as the library and that it's quite a quiet place to play, like super respectful. But even when Scotland like came up with massive actions, like don't get me wrong, the anthems and things are amazing. But then because Australia dominated quite a lot of the possession early on, like it was quite quiet. It was quite eerie. Um, and we we're comparing it to the Frenchness of the whole way through, whether it's a brass band, whether it's choirs, whether it's whatever it is. French rugby is kind of carnival-like. It's much more noisy. Um, but my, outside of the game, which we'll probably talk about as well, even though it's not a Scottish rugby podcast, um, loved Edinburgh. It was great. Did corporate before the game, after the game with Henry Spate, who... I think we all found out was the most handsome man in Edinburgh this weekend, Joe Tamani as well. <laughs> His uh, hair was Barkley. getting a lot of love, Henry. His oh, hair. mate, he's just, he's just a handsome man, isn't he? Like, <laughs> he's a handsome man. So he, he kept getting stopped. The Afro was getting played with. Um, the rest of us were redundant, but we had a good time. Um, and it was good to catch up as well. Because of COVID, you haven't had these catch-ups with old player mates or people you've played with, or it's like Johnny Barkley, Kelly Brown, Jim Hamilton. It was just good to see everyone um, and did the commentary during the game. And then Tim, you and I caught up after the game. Um, one beer. started out as what one beer turned into a few more um, <laughs> and a late night. But, mate, you, you can't beat international weekends. Like the stadium, the buzz, the quality of the rugby was awesome. Um, and catching up with all mates, you know what it's like. It's always a good time. Um, it was difficult to back that up. Like I had to go to Paris on Sunday and commentate on the Bordeaux-Toulon game after not too much slate, which was tough. I think you're idea of backing up nowadays Johnny is a bit different to Jerome's yours is sort of back to back late nights and kebabs Jerome's is <laughs> a bit more professional I couldn't handle those back to back big nights anymore well I mean I think you'd have fitted in with us on Saturday night Jerome because I don't know about you Johnny I don't want to bring you down but it did feel like Mate. we were old men in the corner there was oh. some <laughs> scary a hundred a hundred we years old a <laughs> hundred years old and we are such boring old but it's horrible and that's it the halloween costumes the flesh that's out and now i'm thinking about like my kids my daughter she's gonna be there in 10 i'm like it's scary i'm like get me home i need to get back to my bed <laughs> uh, it's changed mate it's awesome uh but don't get me wrong like nightclubs and stuff now mate it's an alien environment for me i'm happy with some good food a few beers catching up with mates but mate i'm need to get me home before midnight that's my game i'd say Let's talk a bit about the rugby then. Again, we're coming out a bit later in the week, so we'll throw it ahead mainly to Australia facing France. But, Johnny, you touched on it. What will France have learnt from that? 
Um, I think pre-game, I think there's quite a few things that have been leveled at Australia, like a little bit inconsistent, a little bit indisciplined. And don't get me wrong, I don't think either side were utterly dominant at the weekend. Neither team were fantastic, but they just did enough to win against a Scottish side that couldn't put them away. So I think they'll know. And this, again, it's, a, it's an Australian side without Big Will Skelton, without the Arnold boys, without Curtly Beal. Um, but they'll know that they're competitive. They go hard at the breakdown. They compete well at mall time. They slot your ball. They make it difficult. And, and they're not going to be blown over in Paris. Um, so they know they're getting a real test match coming. And also they've had a week prep. They've had a run out together. So they've had one, um, one prep week ahead of the French side, which will make it more difficult. Um, so I think previously, I, I don't want to use the term like a walkover, considering they beat South Africa, beat Argentina, and came within the last kick of beating New Zealand. But I think they would have been seen as a softer touch maybe three, four months ago. Now, you know, first went away from home um, on a five-game tour, they'll be up for it and they'll come to Paris and chuck everything at it. Man, I think the Wallabies showed a lot. It's definitely in the last few months, they've shown a lot of uh, self-belief within the group and, and character. Mm. Um, definitely in the weekend, every time uh, Scotland scored, they seemed to find some way to, to hit back and score again. Um if like you, you play up here in the north and any team that gets a seven or six point lead at home, it's pretty tough to crawl back. And uh, the Wallabies showed that they showed uh, a lot of self-belief, a lot of character to be able to find something to always answer back every time uh, Scotland scored. So uh, for me, the, they did they did it against the All Blacks where they're behind by miles and were able to, uh, I thought they were pretty unlucky to, to, to lose that game as well. Yep. And uh, like Johnny said, beat the Springboks uh, and Argentina. So uh, didn't, not flash wins, not flash games, but they've uh, shown what, uh, what's really important when you want to win uh, close test matches and that's character and self-belief. We'll chat a little bit more about France-Australia when we get our guest on in a minute. But while we're on last weekend, Jerome, what do you make of the All Blacks at the moment? Because there's a lot of chat about them. They obviously beat Japan but weren't convincing. There was a red card in that game. How do you think they'll get on against Wales, Scotland and England? Man, it's going to be tough. Obviously losing uh, their skipper and and a couple of notable uh, leaders, um, Dan Coles and also with Brody being uh, with, with a suspension. So uh, if, if there's anything they want to learn, learn uh, about playing up here it's it's right now if if they want to learn something for the world cup it's uh, it's the next few weeks so it's not going to be easy uh but yeah i think their depth will definitely be tested but um i'll i'll, I'll back them to win all three test matches sorry about that lads but um <laughs> the confidence is still there the kiwi confidence is still there I know that uh, the the best place to be in is is to be uh labeled as the underdog and right. Well, them going into the next three test matches, there's no pressure on them, I think. I think uh, everyone's just uh, going to expect the, the same performances that they've seen pretty much for the uh, most of the year. And um, if the All Blacks go undefeated in these next three test matches, I'd say it's a pretty uh, decent season for them heading into World Cup year. Right, we will chat a little bit about the top 14 later on, Johnny, and we'll bring our guest on in just a minute. But we should get straight to your meter moment of the week. What was the best moment in French rugby this weekend? But it came from the top 14. It wasn't quite Toulouse's performance in Bayonne. Sorry, Jerome. Um, <laughs> but it was another team going away from home. And Jerome, you know how hard it is to go away to this place and win. And Poe did just that at the weekend. Four tries. They competed absolutely everywhere. Like ridiculous to watch. They're bottom of the table prior to the game which nobody, I don't think, over here saw them winning, but they were class. Line out time, scrum, defensively, they scrapped for every bit. Um, and they ran in four awesome tries at La Rochelle and probably the biggest upset of the year so far. Um, La Rochelle struggling with their tens out injured and Poe absolutely capitalized. So this week's moment of, this meter moment of the week is Poe spanking European champions La Rochelle in La Rochelle, which was absolutely insane. Like Johnny said, it's a tough place to play. And oh, I didn't really watch the game. Oh, we were preparing for our Bayonne game and then uh, heading to the bus, I walked past the screen in the lobby and, and saw the scores. Uh, I was pretty surprised, but yeah, definitely a tough place to go and get a result like that. So definitely deserved uh, the game of the week. 
There we go. All in agreement. That was Johnny and Jerome's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. And you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can now get 20% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20, and you'll get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. Let's get our guest on now then, and we can have a chat with a man who won 17 caps for Australia, played for the 2015 World Cup, but is now applying his trade in the south of France with Biarritz. And most importantly, was keeping Johnny company in the corporate suites of Murrayfield at the weekend. Joe Tamani joins us. How you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on. And right. we mentioned it there. Any gloating on Saturday? How was it with Johnny? Uh, look, to be honest, with you, I, did, I didn't want to... Uh... Pissed the guy off. He was kind enough to invite me. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind enough to invite me, uh, and it was it was an awesome experience. I've never really done anything like that before, so um, and I wanted to make sure that I get invited in the future as well. So, like, a hundred percent. They do all these like they do like the um what do you call it? like the report cards. They're like, how good were the guests? And everyone's to obviously everyone's absolutely hammered when they fill these things out at the end. But Jotamani ten, Henry Spate ten. <laughs> Johnny BD, like my mates were like three and a half, <laughs> two and a half. <laughs> but you absolutely killed it. And then it was awesome that, well, it was awesome. It would have been good to go for a beer, but you were exhausted from travel. But Tim and I made the stupid idea to go out for a beer with handsome Henry Spate. And we basically just chatted to ourselves while everyone in, in Edinburgh amazed at Henry. Um, but mate, it was a great weekend. It was great to have you over as well. And obviously a big Wallabies win. So uh, mate, glad you enjoyed it. Um, be awesome to have you back the next couple of years. In terms of the rugby, Jay, obviously it was a, a big win for Australia because they'd lost the last few against Scotland and they, they've lost a few this year as well. So their form wasn't wasn't great. So how big a win was that for them? I think it was huge, especially for this young squad. Um, a lot of these guys, um, you know, haven't really had this sort of experience as well. So um, it, it's good for also Dave Rennie because he's obviously been under pressure. And and from what I heard, and I, and I touched on this a little on Saturdays, like all the boys rave about how good uh, of a culture and environment he's created within that squad. So it was sort of indicating for him as well to get the swim. Um, and, you know, the fruits of his hard work is starting to show now because it, it wasn't the prettiest win for the Wallabies. Uh, Scotland were probably the better side for most of that match, but... Um, that I guess that resilience that he's been trying to install in a lot of these young, uh, in this young squad showed through and, and they were able to grind out a win against a very good Scotland side. And Jerome, as a breakdown coach, Johnny loves a nausey start. Here's one for you, Johnny. A third of Scotland's rucks were under three seconds. So generally, the Wallabies managed to slow Scotland down and Michael Hooper would have been a big factor in that, a guy you know very well, Jerome. Yeah, I definitely hope sort of been a big part of that uh, result but in the last few games that I've watched uh, uh, the Wallabies play they definitely uh, focus uh, a, a huge amount on their winning the contact there's some big contacts every time the Wallabies play so uh, in terms of playing the French I think that'll be key for them to to getting on top of the, the French side especially with the best player in the world playing at scrum half uh, for the French slowing down their breakdown making it annoying for them I think that'll be key I mean, it wasn't just Hooper as well. Like, it was awesome to see him back. Like, was, with everything he's been through over the past year, hmm. World Rugby, mate, it's awesome to have him back on the field. But, like, Slipper, the type five up front as well, the work they got through at Mall, slowing down collisions, like you mentioned, stopping Mall attack and stopping launches. Mate, they were really impressive. That was the collision bit. It will go up a level against France this week because France are more physical than Scotland. They probably got one of the best packs on the planet. But, like the other guy you mentioned there, and I thought from an Australian perspective, I thought Tate McDermott was like an, a bit of an unknown for me as well. So to see him get a run, the danger he threat poses as well to a French defensive line, I'm sure Sean Edwards will be all over Nick White, Tate McDermott this week in their trainings. Um, but yeah, man, just physically, the way they played and the way they bossed that game line, they really restricted Scotland. And then even if they were broken, there were quite a few line breaks and entries into red zone, but the way they scrapped and made big turnovers... Um, in their red zone was really impressive as well. So, mate, there'll be a big test this weekend. It'll go up a level. Like I mentioned before, they've got a game under their belt. They'll be ready. Um, but it'll be a huge game for France this weekend. Johnny mentioned the break he's had there, Joe. Michael Hooper, how important is he to this Australia side? You know, what he offers, not only physically with, 
with his breakdown prowls and and his leadership but just from a spiritual aspect as well like he's he's a huge spiritual leader of that squad um and you know a lot of these young guys that are coming through actually you know grew up watching him play um so he's obviously a huge inspiration to those guys as well so yeah he's hugely important and i think he, he's always been a huge factor in wallaby wins as well in the in the past every game that the wallabies have won uh he's always had a huge influence and you know for for them to get a win over france he'd have to be really influential you played against him tons during I'm sure he was an absolute nuisance to play against, but where does he rank in terms of the uh, the back rows you faced in your career? Oh, without, without a doubt, one of the best. Mate, we talk about the break that he had uh, at the beginning of the season. I'm surprised that it took that long for him to take a mm. little break from the game. He, uh, I think it was 10 years nonstop. He played 80 minutes during every Super Rugby game and then get to the Test Series and he'll play every game 80 minutes as well. And uh, never injured. I'd never see him uh, injured or anything, go off with an injury during games. And did that nonstop. I think he's got the record for the fastest 50 tests and the fastest 100 games in Super Rugby. So uh, for me, I was quite surprised he didn't take a mental break or a, a little break earlier in his career. But um, man, hats off to him. He's such a durable, resilient uh player and I think he's key for for the Wallabies going into this World Cup year. We mentioned the breakdown there. What are the other key factors this weekend then? France, Australia, where's the game going to be won and lost? Mate, breakdown's definitely key, but um, I think uh, up front, the the French pack have uh, created this little... uh, uh, they've got, they've got this. Uh, the they've made a name for themselves that the they're quite brutal, uh, really efficient with their their lineout, their scrum. So I think up front, if you can't uh, get a sentence there, then uh, you might struggle. I definitely agree with Jerome there, um, purely because uh, France need quick ball to, I guess, get their backs involved, and you see how dangerous they are when they do get that quick ball. So. Australia will probably need another stat like they had against Scotland, um, you know, where you said a third of their third of their breakdown were just what was it like under three seconds? Yeah, they're, they're going to need to have that sort of influence, and I think it more so starts in the contact zone, like in the tackle, because uh, a lot of these big bodies, once they get moving and the defense lines get tighter, that just creates more space out wide, and then you got guys like. Uh, the punt in open space it's not going to be pretty for the wallabies i mean someday you've done a pile of analysis in your time when you look from the outside and you watch this french side do you see any perceived areas of weaknesses jerome's just touched on the strengths but if you were dave rennie where would you be looking to attack i think a lot of their strengths depend uh you need possession and i and you also need quick ball um so I think attacking, attacking their forward pack as much as possible, slowing them down, slowing, the, slowing their pace down, especially in the attack, is going to be hugely important. Um, and I think it goes a long way. I think, you know, the teams that they probably struggle with in the past are the teams that sort of limit their try scoring abilities. And, you know, I, I mean... Playing in, playing against some French sides when when things are tight and they start to get desperate and they start you know throwing all these crazy loopy like offloads and and things are just you know when things aren't going well for them is that's sort of the things that you have to bring them into you have to bring them into that sort of dog fight uh, dog fight and the only way you can do that is if you slow their ball down. I might come back and ask you all for a score prediction at the end, but let's have a little bit of a chat about you, Joe, because. We saw last weekend when you were at Murrayfield, we saw Jack Dempsey playing for Scotland against Australia, having won 14 caps for them back in the day a few years ago. And we've seen a lot of players now take advantage of that World Rugby eligibility rule change. You've obviously got Samoan heritage. You've played for the Wallabies. Uh, the likes of Jeff tumunger uh Stephen Luatura now in that Samoa fold. Have you ever been approached or not? 
Uh, no, I haven't been approached, uh, and rightly so. I think a lot of the, the Samoan backs available are, are really good. Uh, you know, competitions, especially in the positions that I play in a, a, a big. So, um, you know, they've got a, a lot of talent in, in, in the backs department. So, um, you know, if, if the phone call does happen, I'll, I'll definitely consider it. It's something that I'll probably have to talk to my mum, dad, and, and my wife about uh, because, you know, ultimately the decisions that I make um, have a huge impact on on them and he's being pretty modest. He'll be in my starting one of our whole team. Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> but well, seriously though, that must have been quite a strange moment for Jack Dempsey. Like growing up in Australia, representing your country fourteen times. I understand he's got Scottish heritage, but then playing against the country that you represented, listening to that national anthem, and then singing the other night, like it must have been a really strange process and a little bit of a head fuck for him for a first cap for a new country. Um, but also, I guess, cool for him in that you've been told by Dave Rennie that he wasn't physical enough and circumstances change and you've got that heritage and the rule changes has worked. But I, I found myself thinking, watching on and watching the anthems, geez, I feel a little bit sorry for this guy. This must be a real head fuck of a first cap for a new nation. Like it can't have been an easy start to play against Australia. Um, but mate, it's weird. I, I didn't think this rule would have a drip down effect on Scotland. I thought it would be more Pacific nations, secondary nations that need a boosted pre-World Cup. And that's it. When we see the boys now that are lining up for Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, um, it just means that like this test window now is going to be even more interesting and mate, all hell is going to break loose in the World Cup with the boys that have been picked back in these teams. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And there's still a year to go, Joe. So there's time yet. We'll um, we'll do a bit. <laughs> Sign of them up. Hashtag bring them back. <laughs> you made the move to France, obviously, with Montpellier back in 2016. Johnny knows Montpellier very well, having played for them. But speaking of kind of international rugby, how tough a decision was that to make? Because obviously, with the Gitto Law, as they call it in Australia, you you would have known that you were kind of ending your international career at least for a period of time yeah um you know i think yeah it, it was a it was a really hard decision because you know growing up in australia all i ever wanted to do was play for the wallabies um and it's it's kind of like your yeah i, I it's kind of like I, I put my dream aside to chase something else i guess and that, that that's really what it came down to is just, you know, at, at that moment, where do I see myself ha and um, in my career and what, what, what else do I want to change, uh, chase and, and achieve? And, you know, uh, originally the reason why I went to Europe is because I wanted the positional change and I wanted to, to uh, sort of migrate back, uh, migrate into the centers and, and I didn't think I was going to get that opportunity playing in Australia. Um, and so, you know, the opportunity in France came with Jake White to sort of start to learn my trade in, in centres because I, I feel like 32-year-old uh, wingers don't, uh, don't have a shelf life, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is why I wanted the positional change and, and obviously develop my game and my skill. And thankfully, I, I got that opportunity. We talked a little bit at the weekend, but how did you find that change? Because it's not evident for everybody. How did you find arriving in Montpellier, different culture, different language? You mentioned coach there. It was Jake. That quite quickly became Vern Cotter. You probably had time under him as well and two coaches in two years. We all know France can be a bit more volatile, but how did you find the change in moving environment initially? Uh, it was really tough. Uh, yeah, and... But it, it was also an awesome experience to sort of one, once you start to see past all of the the French quirks because um, there there are a lot of quirks um, and then you sort of grow to love it um, and you know I was just grateful that I had my wife move with me because she made things a lot easier um, but. Yeah, man, like now that I've come back second time around and I've understood what it's like and what it takes to sort of move here, it, I've grown to just love the place. Having uh, experienced Montpellier and then moving to Leinster, 
And now back in France, back at Biarritz, what would be the one thing that uh, sticks out for you from each of the clubs? Is there, is there a similarity from Montpellier to Biarritz or also Leinster to, to any of the other two? The lifestyle, I guess, is uh, quite similar here in uh, Biarritz to, to Montpellier. And um, I, I'd say the, the way they approach the rugby is completely different. You know, you got... Lenso, who are quite, uh, I, I'd say, structured in a sense, um, ult- ultimate professional side, um, and that's shown to be a successful recipe because of you know how many champion finals they've been in, how many European Cups they've won, and and then yeah, coming to to France, it's sort of I guess opened me up outside of rugby and made me appreciate rugby a little more because, you know, the, the lifestyle makes you, I don't know, live a little, little bit and, and appreciate the things that you actually get. Um, I don't think I appreciated rugby as much when I was in Australia because it just sort of seemed like it was a bit of a job almost. And, and it is, but it's also a privilege. And I think playing in France makes you realize how privileged you are. I mean, to touch on that time at Leinster, Stu Lancaster was your coach there. He's obviously coming to France now to coach Racing next season. How good a coach was he and what can Racing fans expect next year? Oh, man. I, he, he was honestly an amazing coach. Probably one of the best coaches that I had. Um, and his attention to detail, even to like, small things is what I reckon separates him from like a lot of coaches. I was, I was on a podcast last night and I was telling them about one of my first training sessions and we had a little like 10 meter passing drill and they had camcorders out recording us just throw these little short passes. And I was like, Oh, well, surely everyone knows how to throw a pass. You know, you wouldn't be a professional athlete if you didn't know how to throw a pass. Uh, and then the next day we reviewed that little passing segment and we reviewed every single little bit of detail, like where your hand was on the ball. Um, are you catching it early? The last finger that, that should be touching the ball when you release is such and such, you know, like just went into broke down like the skill of passing to its absolute, you know, detail. And I think, that had a huge success on like a lot of the young guys coming through because it sort of showed them the, the kind of uh, application that you need to be uh, at your best. And I think that's what he'll probably bring to, to racing. And I also don't think he'll try and change too much of the, the flair that, that is in French rugby because there is a lot of flair. I think he'll try and bring pieces to manage it and sort of, Teach him, okay, there's a time and place. How you should, you know, like try and teach guys, you know, this is when these sort of situations we need to be able to do this. And and then obviously give him the opportunity to express himself as well. There's not too much flair involved with just getting the ball and passing it to Tui Silva. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Easy, but you also mentioned at the weekend that he was awesome in a sense, like all coaches we work with are very different. You get guys that are very controlling, guys that are very open. And you mentioned that he was an extreme delegator. So he basically just empowered all the players. It was many groups and you essentially go the skill set bits aside, but team templates and how we play, go and create it yourselves, do it yourselves, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, I mean, he he was really big on um, the players driving the culture. Um, you know, having having a place where it's a player led uh, player led team, um, and to me, it, it kind of it, it makes sense because he's not going to be on the field doing it for you. You know, like um, sometimes you can prepare for for matches, and some things aren't going like the things they might have prepared for aren't going to be what the picture that you get on the weekend. So. Being able to problem solve as as a playing group is hugely important, and that's sort of I think that's where his philosophy 
was sort of based based around and you know he just made sure that he gave you um all the tools to prepare you for any sort of situation on the weekend and and I think that's why he's been so successful is that something you're keen on Jerome as a coach because we hear a lot about certain coaches that might be a bit more autocratic and sort of do this do that but it seems like the more time goes on and the more modern we get in coaching things being player-led is more and more important yeah i'm huge on that uh i come from uh, like where i was in new zealand majority of uh our culture our our team environments were heading into being player-led there was a lot of all autonomy being uh, pushed. So uh, even with the All Blacks, uh, Richie, Dan, and a lot of the leaders ran majority of our, our week. So for me, it was kind of a natural thing to go into and a natural thing to be a part of. And uh, I've seen the, the positives and the benefits of having a player-led um, environment, but I've also seen a, a negative effect that it has, especially if the leaders aren't driving what uh, what's best for the for the team. So I can see both, but if uh, if the leaders or whoever the players are, that are driving it, if they're heading it in the right direction, then it's a it's a great great philosophy and great way to have uh, your team. I'm sure those players know who they are, Jerome, the ones that. They're not the right leaders. <laughs> but John, pick your leaders carefully, eh? Well, I was going to say name and shame. Obviously, you can't. But can you give us an example of where the leadership roles ended up in the wrong hands and how this shit hit the fan without naming clubs and people, obviously, naming names? No, it's just in terms of, uh, like uh, Joe said, there's, uh, teams need uh, a level of... Uh, attention to detail, but also like uh, accountability. And if you get leaders who focus a lot more on the social aspects of uh, a team than uh, what's needed on the field to be actually, you turn up and you tell each other what to do, uh, whether it's positive or negative. I've, I've had a team where a lot of the focus was put on enjoying the team environment, whether it's social <laughs> Without naming too many people, or, uh, right? We'll just say it's the babas. It's the yeah, babas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Joe, I don't know how player led it is at, at Beer Ritz, but as someone who would be going in as a as a leader at the stage of your career that you're at, how did that move to Beer Ritz come about, and and why Beer Ritz? Uh, well, Beer Ritz, basically. Yeah. The, <laughs> it's an attractive place to be, I'm sure. Uh, it is. It is an amazing place, but I, I guess. When I was in Japan um, and, and the call came through by Matt Clark, and, uh, who's the director of rugby here, um, what what he did to sell me the place was the fact that he said that they had high ambitions of getting back into the top footing. So they just obviously been relegated and they have a really young squad and high ambitions of being back in the top 14. And, and I saw that as an opportunity to go be a part of something special from the ground up, you know. Um, that that was the most attractive part um, about coming here, you know, coming into a squad with a lot of young guys, hopefully passing on good knowledge um, from my past experiences and and building something special with this this young group. That and the beach, though, eh? Like the beach played a part as well. Well, I can't swim, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of your favourite spots as well, Jerome. You absolutely yeah. love Buretts. Me and my family were there on the weekend with me. Uh, I stayed behind. What a spot. The fact that you've both been all over the world now um, and there's randomly been the possibility of an Anzac team made up of a combination of Kiwis, Aussies playing against the Lions in 2025. What do you make of that as a prospect? That would be incredible. Of uh, even when I was playing in New Zealand, we uh, would always talk about the Lions tour, and uh, we used to always have this comment: "How come they get to combine a team and we don't have one down here?" Nice. And we always thought of uh, having a Springboks, Aussie, and All Blacks um, uh, version of the Lions. It'd be awesome to have the test every couple of years or four years. Um, no, if there's any possibility of that forming, uh, I'll definitely be a supporter. You're not going to come out of retirement, though. Throw your hat and learn to play. <laughs> no, it's not like it. <laughs> Man, I think it'd be huge for, 
for the game, especially in Australia, it, it will create like a, a lot of buzz because the buzz around rugby right now is um, sort of dwindling a little bit, uh, in, especially in Australia because, you know, obviously the, the, there are five major sports that we're very competitive in and, and the talent pool obviously seems to pick uh, a lot of the other sports. So creating something like that where you're getting the best of Australia, the best of New Zealand, playing against the best of Europe, like that, that'll that sell tickets anywhere. They'll sell tickets to Mars, you know, like that's, that'd be awesome. What I'd like to see is uh, the Pacific Isles hey. team back. That would be mm-hmm. unreal. And like, um, I, I think just because there's a lot of um, European based Pacific Islander players now. So they, they already have that attraction with the fans up on this side of the world. Having a Pacific Isles team that are tour p- play against like the European sides, it, I reckon it'll sell tickets everywhere. That was one of the games that I looked forward to the most. So I played it again for Scotland, played against the Pacific Island team at Murrayfield. And I was so pumped to play in it because I'd grown up watching Sitaveni Sivivatu and all these legends wearing this jersey. And that was a chance to play against. So I agree with you 100% as well. If logistically yeah. it's easy and you can pull a team together like a Babas team, but make it a PI's team for Autumn Internationals or whatever it is, and there's a drip down effect economically as well to help out Pacific nations, it's a no brainer. It's amazing. Yeah. If we can sell out stadiums and do it, it's amazing. But in terms of a player playing against it, there was almost no more frightening team to play against because all the best athletes <laughs> in the world are in that one team and then you've got to rock up and play against them. So in terms of incitement, excitement factor as a player and as a fan, I don't think there's any other, apart from maybe a hybrid of the South African, New Zealand, Aussie nations, I don't think there's any more exciting prospect of a team. And Jerome's not coming out of retirement, but we've got an Australia, New Zealand combined team and we've got a Pacific Island team and Joe's putting his hand up for both, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Again, I'll probably be fifth in line for, <laughs> for um, <laughs> both sides. I'll but now, I'll have to be water boy or something. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come for the social aspect, I guess. Yeah. I'll come and lead the charge there. And since we've got you both and we're on this subject, right, we've got Coach Kano as one selector. Joe, not a coach yet, but a very experienced selector in the other corner. We've got a New Zealand Australia combined 15 Oof. at the moment. How many players from New Zealand? How many players from Australia? Chuck some names around. Go. Oh, well, Rico Yuan has got to start at center for me. Yeah. He's like, I'm, I'm surprised he hasn't been World Rugby Player of the Year. He's been nominated a couple of times, but hasn't won. Yeah. Um, he's got to be starting 13 for me. I'll go Adi Savia, Michael Hooper. I'll let either the forwards and I'll try and figure out the backs. Give us the other one in that back row, Jerome. At the moment, I'll go Harry Wilson, Adi Savia, Michael Hooper. Uh, Akira Ioane on the bench. Uh, Locks, I would go Rory Arnold, Sam Whitelock. Mm. Great. Um, Slipper. Um, oh, Cody Taylor and uh, Daniela Tupou. That's a great forward pack. I mean, I would go Aaron Smith, Richie Moanga, uh, you could flip a coin between Tate McDermott and Nick White on the bench. Um, you know, they're, they're both quality halfbacks. Then you would probably would go, I'd go Hunter Paisami, Rico Ioane in the centres. Jordy Barrett at fullback. Tom Wright on one wing. And Caleb Clark on the other. Seems pretty decent, Johnny. Beasts. <laughs> like... That's a good team. Like, yeah. But this is off the top of our head. We need, we need like to give us time. Oh, yeah. But I, I've really left Bode Barrett out of the starting lineup. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, he's, <laughs> he's won two World Rugby Player of the Years, and I've left him out of the starting lineup. Like, he could easily be at 10. 
Then you got Damian McKenzie who could be at fullback. We did put you on the spot. We'll give you a couple of meetings in beer. It's a couple yeah. of coach meetings, yeah. selector meetings. You'll be fine. And also, like, especially with the talent available now, like you imagine you had that team lining up against the Pacific Island team. Mm. Like, never mind the British, British lines, but if you could get that composite team to sell tickets in the Southern Hemisphere or anywhere as a spectacle or take it to America for a spectacle game and sell tickets and spread the word of the game, yeah. it might be insane. Um, so we can do our PI team next week. I mean, we'll that keep... lineup would be what Sammy Rodriguez at 13 versus Rico Ioane. That's they're probably the two most exciting 13s. From the the glamour of the potential of, of, a, of a team like that, Joe, talk us through last weekend because we mentioned you were with Johnny at Murrayfield. But I mean, I dread to think about your journey there because you were play, <laughs> playing away at Ruan <laughs> on Friday night. Yeah. So uh, we. Played Friday night against Ruan away. Um, unfortunately, lost that game. Then I had to be on a, I think it was a 10.30 flight to, to Glasgow. But Ruan's about a two-hour car ride from Paris, Charles de Gaulle. So my morning started pretty early. I, I left Ruan about 6.30 in the morning. I got to Charles de Gaulle at nine, because there's a little bit of traffic. So I was, I was running through Charles de Gaulle trying to find my gate and that airport's massive. So I worked up a bit of a sweat, <laughs> um, sitting on my, on my plat flight. Unfortunately, this girl was just sitting next to me and I was just sweating bullets from running through this airport. And, <laughs> and then got off at Glasgow and uh, John Beatty, legend, unbelievable <laughs> man. Picks me up from the airport and uh, drives me to Murrayfield. We had to be at Murrayfield at like 1.30 for a bit of lo like a logistics meeting. Um, and we were almost late for that because uh, obviously my flight. <laughs> um, watched the game and then went home. Was up at like 4.30 the next day to get a flight to Dublin to meet my wife who was in Dublin for the weekend. And then we flew to Bordeaux and then Caught a train to Biritz. It's a hell of a weekend. The, the main reason I asked was to make me feel better because I, I had a bit of a drive, but that sounds a lot worse. So I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> For clarification as well, that wasn't me that picked you up at the airport in Glasgow. Oh, it was your dad. It was my dad. <laughs> so oh, my dad, yeah. my dad picked you up. How was he as a taxi driver, Joe? How was he? Oh, he, he was awesome. We had great yarns on the way down. <laughs> we covered almost every single topic we could think of. <laughs> it, it, was, it was awesome, you know, like, I um I learned, I got to learn so much about him and and his story and obviously vice versa. It was it was real cool. Best friends now, mate. They're best friends. The type. <laughs> oh yeah. We're gonna do a golf and whiskey tour in Scotland soon. So oh, yes. <laughs> I didn't even get the invite. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't mention the rugby on Friday night in, in Rio. And you mentioned it there uh, 12 9. Sounds like an absolute thriller, but that is about the longest, well, it is the longest journey you can get really from Beeritz, isn't it, in terms of an away trip. I know when Johnny was playing in Prodeder, he used to say they made him catch the bus everywhere, but obviously, tell me they didn't make you catch the bus to Rome. No, we actually flew in that morning. So, yeah, the Beeritz were real Glamour. fine. Glamour. Um, they, they, that's probably the last game we're going to fly to because we lost, though, so... <laughs> But it was real nice. It was it was my first away trip, and we got to fly on the plane. Whereas uh, a few of the boys earlier on the season they played in Van, and that's like a ten hour bus trip. And I was unfortunately injured for that game. Hmm. Okay, mate. I've to, I've to see Jerome's <laughs> other mate as well, John Afo. He's up there now as well. He's in Van enjoying it. But generally, like aside from the logistics and the bus trips and the beers on the way back, like how are you finding Pro Day Do? Because Landing in the top 14, we've already mentioned, can be a culture shock, but Pro De Deux is, is another level compared to other different levels, you know, second tier in England or elsewhere. So how are you finding Pro De Deux in general? Because it's mayhem. Look, it is crazy, but I think the fact that I had experienced France beforehand uh, made it a lot easier for me to transition second time around. And, you know, it's, it's weird. I, I'm sort of enjoying it because it just gives me flashbacks of what it was like when I was before I became a professional rugby player. Um, you know, they still ha have a lot of that sort of, um, that sort of rugby community sense 
in pro to uh if that's if that makes sense you know like it's you know like when i was playing club rugby it's all about hanging out with your mates and enjoying yourself afterwards and and that sort of stuff and you know that's that's sort of the vibe that i'm getting being back in it and and it just gives gives me a little bit of like warm feelings really because you grow to sort of appreciate playing rugby with your mates when it's like that you know but Johnny mentioned comparing it to the English second tier. There, it's just it's great that the the crowds are massive, the the it's vibrant, and it, it's a thriving second tier league in France, which you don't get in most other countries in the world, do you? Oh, it's crazy! Like the the fans here absolutely love this team, and I think, um, you know, it's it's massive for the sport because there's a lot of history and a lot of these pro. Produ- Prodi Deux clubs as well. And and you sort of feel the passion when you talk to a Beeritz fan, um, how passionate they are about the side. It's almost like the team is etched into their, their, their being. That's how passionate they are. And like it, when, you, when you play at home games or away games, it honestly feels like you're playing in, in a top-level competition because of how passionate the fans are. Well, there's a lot of positives and it sounds like you swerved the 10 hour bus trip to van and you flew to ruin. So you, the negatives are all fine. They're out of the way now, Johnny. Well, I haven't experienced the negatives yet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the presidents get involved and all sorts off the field. Then you might have a few negatives until then you'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on Joe and um, sharing your insights into the Wallabies and the secretary in France and everything in between. And um, well, enjoy the, whiskey and golf tour of scotland when you go and see john Beatty over there uh, <laughs> looking forward to it man i appreciate you guys having me on cheers joe pleasure mate thanks brother catch up soon take care guys speaking of edinburgh and having beers johnny how does a free case case of beer sound sign me up mate it is getting cold it's no longer time for beach drinking it's home drinking not leaving the house drinking so if you've got something for me tim send it this way We will send one to you as well, Jerome. With the Autumn Nation series back and Christmas coming up, our very good friends at Beer 52 are offering you a free case of eight craft beers. All you have to do is go to beer52.com forward slash French and cover the meagre postage costs of £5.95 to claim your free case now. Each month, they send their members a case of beer from a different part of the world. And we've been a member of Beer 52 for a while now, me and you, Johnny, and we absolutely love it. It's class. They showcase the best independent breweries from across the globe. So there's no better way to enjoy a good beer during this year's Autumn Nation series. So far, members have experienced beers from 40 different countries spanning five continents, from big, juicy pale ales and crisp, refreshing lagers to delicious, sumptuous stouts. You can try the best beers from across the world with the UK's number one beer club. And if dark beer is not your thing, you can choose the light only case and you get the award-winning ferment magazine a couple of tasty snacks included as well and if after all that you're still not satisfied for whatever reason you can simply pause or cancel at any time so what are you waiting for just head to beer52.com forward slash french to claim your free case now that's beer then the numbers 52.com forward slash french and a case of beer can be on its way straight to your door a lot of international chat there so not too much time to touch on the top 14, although we did discuss the Polar Rochelle game earlier on. But before we get into a, a bit of top 14 action, transfers, there's always transfers. Is Dan Bigger in Toulon already or not? Man, he's still being, like nothing's been announced yet. So Jerome probably knows he's signed for Toulouse and we don't, but uh, <laughs> no. he's still between Racing, Clermont, um, Toulon. There's still two or three clubs chasing a big 10. Um that with Matthew Jalibert on the market, Yanchis as well from South Africa. So it hasn't been announced yet, but mate, there are tons of things floating around. Jamie George potentially to Clermont with things really changing in England. We saw Baptiste Couillou as well at Lyon. He activated his liberation clause this week, which is always a tough conversation to have with the president. Actually, I, I want to leave. I don't want to take up my plus one. When it comes from a player, it's always hardcore. There's rumors he might be going to Stade Francais. Thomas Dutoy. Um, he's at the South Sea Sharks. He was a joker for Toulouse yeah. in 2019. You probably played with him, Jerome. It's been yeah. announced he's going to Lyon. Pierre Popelin, 
moving from La Rochelle to cast Joshua Tuasova, who would definitely be in the PI's team. His yeah. move to Racing is con- to confirmed. Um, I mean, there's loads of movement up in Racing as well, like Wenceslas Laurie, Bernard Larue with injuries that potentially saying they're both stopping end of the year. So, like, it's crazy. And some movement on the coaching side of things as well, Johnny. Yeah, so it was announced today, Olivier Azam has left his role at Montpellier. Um, for family reasons, it's been announced, but you never know. And looking to go back and join family in England. Um, and already, like the way it works, like Jerome knows how the market works. You've already got three, four guys lined up to take his job mm-hmm. the day after he's gone. So you've got Yannick Brew, um, David Atub, and Patrice Colazzo as well, all lined up. So good coaches looking to go in and fill a spot. And Montpellier obviously looking to up the game and change a little bit what they're about up front um, after a couple of hard weeks. So, yeah, loads of movement. Anything in Toulouse, Jerome? Any scapes you can give us? <laughs> uh, no news here, apart from uh, a lot of my ESPO boys getting scooped up to play for the pro, pro team. I mean, on that note, so a few of your players again showed real character coming back. Like they were down massively in Bayonne at halftime. Mm. But some boys really stood up. Intermac yeah. was, was decent, not Roman, but Theo, number eight, who I worked and did some of the games he played for the 20s. Like he can carry a ball and offload and some excitement excitement in him, your halfbacks as well. You mentioned them previously last time you were on, but how proud of, were you of those young guys to come back in those types of circumstances in that type of stadium in Bayonne? Yeah, I was really proud. Obviously, in the first half, everything was uh, pretty one-sided. Um, Bayonne winning the contact, had all the momentum, uh, making the right decisions. And then in the second half, I think our guys just wanted to just get the ball and play. I think what was holding us back was our discipline. But you're going to get there when you've got young guys playing. They're just keen to get into everything, uh, keen to play. But, uh, yeah, the level changes when she, once you go from Esquad to top 14. They found that out. But to stay in the fight and come pretty close to, to winning the game, I was pretty proud and, uh, uh, despite uh, – who was missing in our team and how uh, how well Bayonne were playing. But yeah, definitely uh, really proud and hopefully they can back it up this weekend. And speaking of just wanting to get the ball and play, we spent an awful long time talking about him last week, Johnny, so we won't dwell on it too much this week. But we have to mention him, Finn Russell, 23 mm. points again in Racing's win away at Breve. He's certainly got a point to prove maybe and he's playing well still. Oh, look, his form's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all we can say uh, again so far this season I think he's been 91% uh, off the tee as well so like he's kicking well Scotland could have done with a kicker at the weekend um, 23 points and mate three key passes to set up three key tries to win away from home and breathe for a team that are battling for their lives so he's been consistent he's playing well he's not quite making the cut at the minute for the Scottish side but he's still killing it for Racing 92 and you were doing the Sunday night game Johnny Bordeaux, we've spoken about them a bit so far this season, up and down. They came back from 2010 down to beat Toulon, didn't they? Yeah, and again, they really struggled to control the game. That was quite similar to the Scotland-Australia game. They just Nobody wanted to control it. Kind of messy conditions, error strewn, discipline was poor. A couple of free tries. Big Kane Douglas, like I'm not sure if you watched the game, but Kane Douglas, the Aussie second row when he came on, just monstered people. He really changed things and the physicality went up a level in the second half when he came on. And it really came down to not too much between the sides, but Bordeaux managed to pin down one piece of possession with a minute to go in Toulon 22. Vazea sticks his hands in when he shouldn't. That was a brain fart. And that's it, three points as the ball game. So it wasn't pretty, but Bordeaux again, who'd already lost one at home opening game of the season against Jerome's mob, um, they came close to it again to losing to Toulon this weekend, but they just got across the line. So a really important win for them. Let's have a very quick look ahead to this weekend's games then. And we chatted a lot about it earlier on. So let's get your score prediction in. What is happening with France, Australia? France winning, uh, I would say 32 15. Yeah, I don't want to say comfortable, but I think it will be comfortable. Um, I, maybe not quite as big a margin. I'll go France by 12, but I think they've got enough. Um, times have changed now. They get prepped together, even though they've had injuries, they've had time together as a squad. They've got some key men back from injury as well. Serial Bai has been back. It looks like he's either going to be on the bench or start. He's super important for them. Um, and yeah, I think they'll have just too much, too much power up front. 
uh, for the Aussies and a big blitz defense that the hobby Aussies haven't faced so far. The Wallabies haven't faced that in a little while. I think they might be in for a little bit of a shock as the ABs were this time last year. Um, and I think they might come unstuck. So France comfortably by 15 points. And we won't go through all the Autumn Nation series games, but you mentioned earlier, Jerome, you were confident in the All Blacks. So give us a prediction for Wales and New Zealand. I can't give you a score, but I'll go All Blacks by 20. I've got ABs by 17, I've written down. Um, I think as well, mate, so much gets banded around against the ABs. The closest I ever came with Scotland was like, a, I think it was like a six point or an eight point gap. And like, that was as close as we got. But when you talk about the ABs and everyone talks them down, I'm like, it's just at your peril. Like they're going to come over here and kick the shit out of people. That's what's going to happen. That's what I think is going to happen is, oh, this is the most beautiful ABs team we've seen forever and this and that. And then they're going to come over here with a bit between their teeth and unleash on Wales this weekend. So I would say New Zealand by 17. And what's the pick of the top 14 to look out for this weekend, Johnny? Um, to lose, mate, again, I don't want to ask Jerome what his team is and he gives away his hand. Um, but again, without that many internationals, it's obviously going to be difficult. Um, you boys will taking a lot from the heart that was shown in the character um, in the second half, but it's never easy when you put out the kids. That's the thing. And Ugo Mola spoke really well about how proud he was and the pride um, he had in them. But that'll be a toughie as well. Like, I, I think that will just be nicked. I think that'll be a really close game. I'm going to go for that one to lose by four points to beat Stade Francais and to lose. Cheers, mate. <laughs> you can talk about other games mate so Leon versus Cast Toulon versus like, Montpellier as well how do you see those ones going I'll go Cast over Leon. in Lyon yep big Cast one over Lyon um, uh, pick Toulon over Montpellier and what was the last one and Stade Francais to beat Toulouse no, 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 <laughs> no chance. And we've we've mentioned we're getting the beers in for Christmas, Jerome. Obviously, we're a bit early, but in the lead up to Christmas, <clears throat> you're going to bring us a code as well, aren't you? You've got some underwear to sell us. Yes, me and uh, a couple of my best mates from uh, New Zealand have an uh, underwear company. I swear to God, they'll be the most comfortable underwear you've ever worn in your life. So I'll yes. send you towards a couple to try so you guys can... Uh, Say if you like them or not, but uh, we'll definitely have a code for you guys, uh, a discount code for you to hop on and, and purchase some. Perfect time for Christmas as well. Get them in for your brothers, get them in for your dads, grandpas. And are they for all shapes and sizes as well? Drew? All shapes and sizes. This is going to sound like quite an odd thing to say, but I'm pregnant at the moment. In you know, <laughs> not physically myself, but it kind of has the same effect. A lot of pizzas, a lot of curries. So we go from uh, size extra small to five XL. So uh, holy, we got covered. us covered. Yeah, we got everyone covered. Awesome. Well, we'll have that discount code for everyone next week. Yeah. Now, uh, where would they go to find it? What's so the name of the company? Memware.co. We look forward to uh, getting our hands on a pair of those, don't we, Johnny? Couple, mate. And then Joe will probably be buying them for my dad for Christmas. It's not. It's not. It's not, it's not this is stuck with me. But mate, that's it. Now I've got grandpas. Dads, <laughs> uncles, brothers, I know what I'm getting them for Christmas. This is going to be everyone's stockings, mate. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Jerome and for Joe for joining us. And thanks to you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Cheers, fellas. Cheers, guys. Bye.